Picture this for a moment. It's the summer of 2002. I am in high school in Dubai, and my grandparents are visiting us from India. I remember many evenings spent with them, playing Scrabble, watching movies, and enjoying Bengali treats. My grandmother was my best friend. I would chat with her about her life and share milestones from mine. Now fast forward 10 years to 2012, I'm a graduate student interested in studying the brain, and I return to India to visit her. I walk into her room, and in silence realize that she doesn't recognize me. She had no idea who I was. That one moment became my motivation to unravel the mysteries of the brain. To better understand memory disorders, I had to start at the basics. What is a memory? There are four components to a memory. Who, when, where, and what. For example, if we could go back in time and look at a single memory in my brain, the who is my parents, the when I was in eighth grade, the where we were at the school's soccer field, and the what they were watching me score the final goal. All this information had to arrive at the blue part of my brain, the entorhinal cortex, and is later stored as a memory in the red part, the hippocampus. Our memories not only make us who we are, but they allow us to make sense of the world. And then, at a later time, we recollect these beautiful experiences with exquisite detail. As a result, when we cannot remember, it's heartbreaking. Of course, there are natural cases of forgetting, like where we put our keys or where we parked our car at the mall. Hopefully, it's not just me. But then, we have to deal with memory disorders, among which Alzheimer's disease is by far the most common. It's been over 100 years since the discovery of Alzheimer's. As of 2016, there are over 40 million people suffering worldwide. What does this mean for our generation? One out of nine people over the age of 60 will develop Alzheimer's. This could be your friend, your sibling, your parents, or you. Unfortunately, there are no promising treatment options available today. There has been some hope that electrical stimulation of the brain may improve quality of life. But this is like being in a car crash and trying to jumpstart the battery hoping to fix the car. This approach hasn't been very effective because we now know that there are so many different types of cells, and so our treatments need to be more targeted. With this knowledge in mind, I started researching Alzheimer's. Since I couldn't work with human patients, for obvious reasons, my work uses mouse models. Now, you must be wondering, how do we know these mice have Alzheimer's disease? In addition to memory loss, we can look at the brains of these Alzheimer mice under a microscope, as shown up here, and what you'll see are these large round deposits known as plaques, which is exactly what we find in human patients. Then, I needed a way to measure their memory, since I couldn't just ask them if they remember. To be honest, that would make our lives a whole lot easier. I chose a test in which a mouse has to form a new fear memory, which would say something like, this box is scary. It's very simple. You take a mouse, put it in a box, and you deliver foot shocks, which they won't be happy about, similar to the feeling we get when touching light switches with wet hands. And then, a day later, you bring the mouse back into the same box. Normally, mice are very active in a new environment, but when they remember this box is scary, they don't move around so much. When we performed this test in Alzheimer mice, we noticed that they couldn't remember this experience. So we spent a lot of time and effort trying to figure out what was wrong in the brains of these Alzheimer mice, which was like looking into a black box. One morning, we caught a break. As we were studying many different samples, we noticed something. The neurons in the brains of Alzheimer mice that stored this memory experience had fewer connections with one another. Take, for example, this green memory neuron, technically known as a memory engram, among the many other blue neurons. Along its branches, if we zoom in, what you'll notice are these tiny protrusions, each of which represents one point of communication with another neuron in the brain. The fact that Alzheimer mice had fewer connections told us something. Think of each of these protrusions as the individual lanes of a toll booth, where you have a source neuron trying to send information to cars to a destination neuron. Now, when all lanes are open, information transfer is a smooth process. But what happens in Alzheimer's is that some of these lanes are closed, and as a result, the mouse cannot remember. 
So this was a turning point for our research because we knew what was wrong in the brains of Alzheimer mice and needed a way to fix it. I chose a method that allows us to activate neurons with pulses of blue light. By repeatedly activating memory neurons deep in the brains of Alzheimer mice, I could restore their connections, which was like reopening all lanes of the toll, toll booth. So here's the million dollar question. Does this bring back the supposedly lost memories? We return to the fear memory test, which you all are experts on now. Let's see what happened. Here's a typical example of a mouse in a new environment. Very curious and active. On the other hand, here's a mouse who remembers this box is scary. When we performed fear memory recall in Alzheimer mice, we noticed that they treated the scary box as if nothing bad had happened. So at this point, we applied our neuron connection restoring protocol and retested them. To our surprise, the Alzheimer mice were now scared of the box, exactly like normal mice. We made the forgetful Alzheimer mouse retrieve its lost memory. So what does this mean for the future? We found light in the brains of Alzheimer mice, a black box, and have a way of repairing the broken parts. Over the next 10 years, I hope we can develop a method for human patients, which would have to be a little less invasive than plugging lasers into our brains. But the answer lies in targeting the appropriate cells in Alzheimer's, rather than trying to jumpstart the entire brain. If my grandmother were still here, just maybe I could have helped her remember me. We have a long road ahead of us. But I am optimistic that we are going to win the battle against Alzheimer's disease. Thank you.